Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. It was dark outside the windows and another heavy, full of thoughts. Night was coming. Alexander couldn't sleep. He kept tossing and turning in one place. He would lie on his back or turn over on his side. It seemed to him that from the garage heard a suspicious noise and shouting. Well, I'm in trouble. It was necessary to get so hit. If my wife didn't find out, she'd file for divorce immediately. She'll say that I've got a brother. The zeros are over. Hey, it's too late to change anything. If you're already on the slippery slope, get out of it as best you can. The main thing is not to shine before the time. His wife turned to Alexander and hugged him by the shoulders. Alexander, why are you sleeping? Insomnia again. Take sleeping pills so you'll fall asleep faster. Angelica, sleep. Everything is fine. It's just been a hard day. You know me, your Alexandra will always think of something to occupy your brain at night. The woman sighed and kissed her husband on the cheek. She turned on her side and was soon snoozing peacefully. My darling, if you knew what I've done, you'd probably be packing your things right now. Alexander thought tiredly. He tried, but in vain his head stubbornly refused to relax. The old man got up, put on his robe and tiptoed out of the bedroom. There was an ominous, suspicious silence in the house. The man stepped out of the house and froze, listened. The moon shimmered dimly, not a single rustle. I wondered if it seemed so. I'll check anyway, Alexander said to himself. Nature seemed to have frozen in expectation of sudden changes. The old man stood for a while at the door of his own garage. His frowning face was illuminated by the glare of the moon. From this mysterious light, falling at a peculiar angle, Alexander's appearance was truly menacing and even mystical. Nature seemed to be frozen in anticipation of something sinister. Alexander stood for a moment at the door of his own garage. A moment more, and he pulled the handle decisively. The room was warm. The owner liked to spend a lot of time in the garage, repairing his car, so the man even installed gas heating, so as not to freeze. Ford, the love and pride of Alexander's entire life, stood in complete darkness. The round headlights reflected the light of the moon peeking from behind the half-open door. The man touched the car with great tenderness, cold, but ready to start at any moment. Just like an angry woman, he touched the trunk, leaned into it and whispered, be patient for a while. I'll let you out soon. Just sit quietly. There are plenty of ravines around. No one will notice your disappearance. Alexander was born in the forgotten town of Kizio, California. His mother, Selena, was Afro-American, his father a true dag, living according to all the canons of Islam. At first, the young lived soul to soul. But when the children were born, things took a turn for the worse. Alexander's father worked practically round the clock, and when he came home, his mother was badly beaten for any trifles. She served food to the table in a wrong way or did not do a good job in bed. Alexander, like his mother, did not like the presence of his father at home. The boy, hearing the sound of heavy work boots outside the door, pulled his head intensely into his shoulders, waiting with fear for the next scandal. The father never pitied, neither the children nor the mother. Therefore, the image of the most kind-hearted man who believed in the justice of the laws of the Koran sank into memory, hidden behind an incomprehensible haze. Alexander's sisters, Olivia and Katie, unconditionally followed all the instructions of the strict head of the family. They were terrified of cruel punishments. The day came when their mother could no longer tolerate their father's behavior. But how to escape? Where to? The parents are far away in the United States, and leaving is an impossible mission. A woman in this country has no rights, no liberties. The first time the mother and children tried to run away from home, when the father once again went to work, the documents of his wife and children were well hidden by a calculating man, but he did not even guess that the mother has long known about the stash and waits for the moment to leave quietly. The woman gathered the most necessary things, found the stash of documents and ran out of the house. A cat was waiting for her at the gate. Selena decided to get as far away as she could. Next she would find a hostel and settle in. Then, she would go to the embassy to legally leave the city. But everything went wrong. The neighbors, seeing that the mother and her children were leaving in a hurry by car, immediately called Hazem. 
The neighbor saw the mother and children leaving in a hurry in a car and immediately called Hazem. But no one was there. Hazem gathered his friends and neighbors of the men and asked about the car and the driver who had witnessed the family's escape. A few hours later, the man found his wife and children near one of the inexpensive hostels. Hazem took the unwanted with the children home and put them under lock and key. Now the mother had no right to see the children. The man hired a housekeeper, an old fat woman who smelled bad. The housekeeper had to clean the house, cook food, look after his wife and children, carry water and food to them. What was going on in Selena's soul at that time was hard to describe. Now she was deprived of everything, the opportunity to go to her homeland, to see her father and mother, to raise her children in love and respect. What will they see in this hole? I should have listened to my mother. She was right. A hot temper is not always an indicator of love, thought the woman, wiping tears from her face. A few years passed. Hazem again allowed the woman to move around the house, but the housekeeper remained. The woman knew that the old woman was looking after the family. Now to escape, one had to be more cunning. The mother had to gain her husband's trust, do as he told her, to fulfill his every whim. It was very difficult. The man was a tyrant, he liked to abuse his wife, but the mother, who wanted to leave the walls of the house as soon as possible, tolerated and obeyed. The children knew everything and listened to their mother. Only Alexander was contradictory. He refused to spend time with his father, did not accept toys from him. The man was very angry. Alexander, well, be patient a little. Soon we will leave, whispered his mother, hunting the child. You just need to obey your father, and he'll be kinder. Mom, I can't see him beating you. How he bullies you. Why can't we just call the police? They'll put him in jail and we'll be gone. Baby, if only it were that simple. Only in fairy tales there's a magic carpet airplane, a good witch who helps people. In the regular world you have to fight for everything. You're a fighter, aren't you? Look, your sisters listened to me, and your father stopped watching them a long time ago. And your bad behavior and unwillingness to talk to him only draws your father's attention. Be nicer to him, even if you have to smile. Mom, I will do everything as you want, utter boy, but when I grow up I will fight by my own rules. No one will hurt my family. Lord, give a real childhood to my children. Let my husband forget about us for at least a minute and we'll run away, prayed the kneeling woman. The police in California could not help the mother in such a delicate situation. It was her own fault. She had to please her husband, not contradict him. Neighbors also did not want to interfere in the showdown. They had enough to do. The American woman was left alone with her heavy burden. Help came from where she didn't expect it. One day the old housekeeper Betty beckoned the woman to her. She didn't speak English well, but her mother could understand her. It's time for you to run away. Your parents went to the embassy in your country, but they couldn't help them. They said you have to go to the California Department of Corrections and prove that your husband is torturing you and the children. Then you can leave. Betty. But how did you find out about all this? Why are you telling me all this? The woman winked. I was paid well by a handsome man. He's been asking about you. He looked like a real American, dressed like an American. I won't give you away. Don't be afraid, the old woman said hastily when she saw the woman's frightened look, so that you can leave quickly. I'll back you up, distract the master if necessary. Thank you, Betty. The young woman was overjoyed. There was a ray of light ahead. Not all was lost. The main thing is to get to the department unharmed, and there she will not be allowed to offend. The days flew by. The woman waited stubbornly for the moment when Betty would say she could leave. Selena lay on the low davit. Hasem had left for work an hour ago. They had had another argument. The man had said he would have a serious talk with her when he returned. Selena knew what he meant. A severe beating was unavoidable. The children sat quietly in their room. There was a rustling in the doorway. The woman stood up and quickly opened the door. It's time for you and the kids to go. I'll take you up through the backyard so the neighbors won't tell your husband. Betty, what a joy. But what about you? They'll kill you. Don't worry. I'll walk you out and I'll be out of the house in no time. He won't find me. I'll be taken care of. Little Alexandra overheard his mother and the housekeeper talking. He went back to his room and said to his sisters, Time to pack. Remember where your bags are. Grab them and wait by the door. Alexander felt a sudden rush of courage and responsibility for Olivia and Katie's lives. 
Meanwhile, the mother gathered the bags. Beatty gave her their papers. Where did you find them? Selena asked, deeply surprised. Hazem had hidden them. Thank you, kind woman. I will never forget what you did. They embraced. Selena was crying with joy. All right, mistress, we can't wait. Take the children and let's go. He's been waiting for you for a long time. Who is he, this kind soul? How did he find me? Thought the woman with interest as she and the children ran across the yard to the back exit. At the gate stood an old dirty car of an obscure model. A tall Afro-American man was waiting for them. Let's go, all questions later. The woman put the children in the car and looked at Betty. She stood two steps away and smiled. Betty, run now. God forbid anyone should see you. The housekeeper sighed heavily and walked back into the house. Her heavy footsteps could already be heard on the porch. Selena looked at her. She didn't even know then that this was the last time she would see Betty alive. The man got behind the wheel, quickly started the car, and they raced along the narrow roads of Kizior. Tell me, Selena, how did you get into the clutches of this animal? Didn't you see where he came from and what customs his people had? All you women are fools. First, you marry foreigners. Then you look for a place to escape from this beast. Muslims are strict. It's not like the U.S. It's good that your parents told me, asked me to help you. Tell me, who are you? The man started talking. I'm a volunteer. I work with people like you. I help them get justice, help them avoid death at the hands of a Muslim tyrant. I'm new to California. Your father and mother contacted me. I don't know where they found my phone number, but I decided I had to go before the worst happened. The girls in the back seat fearfully squeezed each other, and Alexandra listened attentively to the conversation of adults. Of course, he did not quite understand a lot of things, but the main idea caught them saved. The boy was not at all sorry for his father. The child for his short life has not seen anything good from the man, except for the demands, humiliation of his mother. I am very grateful to you, the mother said with warmth in her voice, I can't even convey my joy. I once tried to run away from my husband, but it didn't work. Now we will come to the department, the volunteer Rita Schurger, and you will tell us how everything happened in the family. The children should be with you. Their testimony is also very valuable. If everything goes well, you'll be divorced even without the presence of your husband. Can you tell me your name? Selena asked. Evan is the easiest name to understand. Evan. Evan, I'll find you when you get back to the U.S. Thank you so much. As the man dropped off the mother and children in the courtyard of a large white building, Selena sighed with relief. Now she could not be afraid. People who are loyal to wives work here. A week passed. Selena successfully ended her marriage to Hazem. The man found out that his wife was hiding in the department, and he even got them to let him in to see his disreputable wife. But Selena knew how it would end and refused to see the man, citing that he could cause irreparable harm to her children. Hazem harbored a grudge against her. Finally, the day came when the woman and her children were able to leave California and return to their native country. All the necessary documents were ready. But when Selena was walking, practically running with her children, accompanied by even the volunteer and several other representatives of the United States in California, to the airplane ramp, disaster struck. From the direction of the department's back exit, sharp gunshots suddenly rang out. Olivia and Katie immediately fell to the ground Alexander and Selena were covered by Ivan. His chest was quickly covered with bloodstains. Get to the plane. You can't save your daughters, save your son. Selena, howling with pain and grief, grabbed Alexander and ran into the airplane. Behind her back, the volunteer who had saved innocent lives twice screamed hoarsely in pain. As the plane took off, through a veil of unceasing tears, Selena saw through the porthole as the local police in full uniform ran onto the takeoff pad. They had taken her ex-husband in a ring and had pulled the man to the ground. The woman looked painfully at the bloody bodies of the girls, but they didn't move. Even froze too. I'm sorry, I didn't keep you safe, Selena sobbed, when the plane had already gained altitude and the whole bloody picture disappeared from sight. Little Alexander didn't cry. He huddled in the corner of his chair and stared at one point. On his table was the standard meal of porridge, a piece of bread, an apple, and a fresh cherry. It was the cherry that looked very much like the drops of blood on the sister's cheeks. I didn't feel like eating at all. Sonny, my darling, Celine whispered, I'm sorry. I didn't keep you all safe. The woman pressed the boy with force, 
as if she was afraid that now he would fall to the ground from the airplane. Russia met the fugitives with bright sunshine and warmth, spring was in full swing. Selena looked with pleasure at the native expanses, which she had not seen for a long time far below where birch groves, green fields and such green had never been, all yellow wastelands and burdocks. When the plane landed, the woman exhaled. That's it, you can no longer be afraid of anything. Her parents ran to the gangway, her mother crying and her father ruffled. Such dear faces. Hazem had prevented the woman from communicating with her parents even over the internet. The first meeting after a long separation was overwhelmingly joyful, full of tears. Where are the girls? Selena asked the mother. She only shook her head and burst into tears. Hazem. He killed them, Alexandra said slowly. He stood with his fists clenched tightly. His gaze read determination, anger, and even rage. He had taken from his father everything a man needed a hot-hearted brave man. His life was just beginning. The most interesting things awaited the boy ahead. Hey, Alexander, take it easy, chatted John impetuously. The old man stood near the house and watched how the guy sharply accelerates, then just as sharply reduces speed. Stop, I say. John couldn't stand it any longer and followed the dust cloud. I shouldn't have taught him. He's gone completely off the rails, Granson. Alexander saw nothing in front of him. He flew like a bird, slightly twisting the steering wheel on the turns. It seemed to him that in a moment he would take off, he just had to clamp the gas pedal tighter. His grandfather was running behind him and waving his fists. Not grandfather. Alexander shouted through the window and pressed the gas pedal even harder. He drove into the field and raced straight down the dusty road. There was nothing to breathe in the car, so he had to close the windows. Alexander drove up to a shallow lake and stopped the car. The water beckoned to its depths. The guy quickly undressed and dived into the coolness. How good it felt! Alexander dived again and again, reached the bottom with his hands, scaring small fish. Having swam to his heart's content, the guy got out of the water and shook himself like a big dog. It was wildly hot, but it was cool near the lake. Alexander liked this place few people came here, too far from the village. The guy let the sun dry his skin and brown it a little, then quickly got in the car and drove back. Now my grandfather would give me a task, Alexander smiled to himself. More than ten years had passed since little Alexander had set foot on American soil, having escaped from Kizyar with his mother. The boy was very much worried, cried all the time, he had the same nightmare every night. He looks at his dead sisters and his mother calls him to the plane. Selena had to find a good psychiatrist for Alexander. Long months of rehabilitation of the boy gave their fruits. Alexander became much easier and time a little tightened the fresh wounds of memory. Alexander's mother traveled more than once to Washington, D.C., to the California Embassy. She wanted to know how her daughters were buried, what happened to her ex-husband, and what was the fate of even the volunteer. She learned from the rulers that Olivia and Katie were buried by neighbors with full honors in the local cemetery. Hazen was sentenced to life in prison for killing his daughters in Beatty, the family's housekeeper. Even the volunteer survived and was now rehabilitating after being wounded in Washington, D.C. Salima even traveled to the capital to visit the guy who saved her life. There they had an affair, but the woman was in no hurry to go home, to please her parents. She fell through the ground. Alexander's grandparents desperately tried to find Selena, but then in Soviet times, investigations into the disappearance of people were conducted for a very long time and often did not bring any results. Alexandra at first was very grieving for his mother. You bet, the boy had witnessed the murder of his siblings, lost his father, and now his mother. I mean, no. His mother abandoned him, left him and went to another man. The search for his mother has not yielded any results, the militia has been throwing up their hands. If she left with the man she loved, it means that she had her reasons. Selena's father and mother grieved very much, but there was nothing to do. They had to bring up their grandson. He was left an orphan with living parents. It is probably impossible to describe in words how difficult it was for John and Leslie. The boy had to dress and eat well. His grandfather had to find part-time work, and his grandmother adapted to bake cakes and pastries to order. That's how they lived. Selena did not make herself known. Alexander began to gradually forget about his mother. He quickly grew up and more and more resembled his father black curls, brown eyes, dark skin and sharp temper. As a teenager, the boy often got into fights. Not even because he had been wronged, he didn't like injustice and often defended the weak. 
Leslie, once again visiting the principal's office, listened to a whole lecture that her grandson is a real street kid. He steals money from school children, fights, skips lessons. Alexandra, in turn, at home swore that all this is a pure lie. One day the phone rang in Leslie's room. The woman quickly picked up the phone. Hello, who is it? There was a rustling and sobbing sound in the receiver. Mommy, hello. It's me. Leslie froze in surprise. She had never hoped that she would ever hear her daughter's voice. Selena, are you, are you okay? Where are you? Mom, I'm fine. I'm with Evan. We're expecting a baby. Joy was quickly replaced by anger. So you left us Alexander, abandoned him, and decided to start a new family. The woman yelled, furious. Mom, you listen to me. No. You listen to me. Your father and I work day and night to feed Alexander. And you haven't even sent him a birthday card once. Do you realize that Alexander calls us mom and dad? He's completely forgotten you. Mommy, Selena on the other end of the line burst into tears. Alexander looks so much like Hazen. I can't look at him. It brings back memories of all the abuse from my ex-husband. Mommy, I'll make up for it only when we get back on our feet with Vanya, and I'll send you some money. You know what Leslie said in a murderously quiet voice. We don't need your money. We should have taken care of it earlier. I won't tell Alexander anything about your call. Let the boy grow up peacefully knowing that you just vanished into thin air. Don't call here again. You're not our daughter now. Leslie hung up the phone with a bang and burst into tears. What's wrong, Grandma? A disheveled grandson came running into the room. He just woke up. Nothing, Alexander, it happens to me, quietly said Leslie and with great tenderness pressed his grandson to himself. Adults are such strange people. Sometimes, to get rid of problems, we need to cry. Alexandra, not understanding what the grandmother is saying, just silently pressed against her, the most dear person. Oh, you scoundrel, yelled John, holding on to his heart. Who authorized you, you little brat, to go so far away? Tell me. Alexander got out of the Ford and laughed merrily. Grandpa, you've been teaching me to drive for almost three years. I know your car like the back of my hand. Why are you yelling? I'll show you how to fly on the road. You don't even look around, you insolent bastard. What if you'd hit someone? Grandpa, I did everything very carefully and adjusted the mirrors. What's the matter with you, really? Alexander carefully hugged John. He grumbled for a long time, but the old man's heart thawed a little. Let's go wash her now, you see how grimy she is. The grandfather mumbled with his toothless mouth. Alexander nodded in agreement. They got into the ford and drove into the yard. A water fountain was bouncing merrily. The drops of water, passing through the sunlight, shimmered with all the colors of the rainbow. Alexander ran with a rag and washed the car windows. The 1972 model year was John's main pride. His grandfather had been saving up for a car for a long time. He wanted to buy a Ford, but he had to spend part of his financial reserves on Alexander, and there was no money for the third member of the family. John, not thinking long, got on an electric train and went to the capital. From there he returned happy, turning the steering wheel of a new Ford. Leslie only waved her hands. She had expected her husband to buy something larger, with additional passenger seats. Wife, come on, get in. You will ride next to me, the old man said with pride in his voice. He was glowing with happiness. Leslie shrugged and tried to sit on the seat. She did not succeed the first time, but the woman was quite sturdy. Come on, John, I'll sit in the back. What, are you afraid? The old man laughed. It's all right, you can relax with me. Alexander, come here, you're coming with us. Ford pleasantly rumbled, and the happy family left on the first trip on four wheels around the village. Rode to a shine, the car shone like a precious stone. Neighbors, hearing the roar of the Ford, ran out into the street. Some watched with fear as John turned the car sharply, while others whistled with delight. Alexandra, proud as a peacock, looked out of the open window. Only rich people had cars in the village. But John glowed as if he too had been polished to a shine. Leslie gave a deafening gasp as the car bounced on the big bumps. The woman had never driven a car like this. It flies like a dragonfly, she marveled. That's right, wife. Now we can go wherever we want. Where do you want to go? Let's go to Washington, smiled the wife. I was there only once, when? So no. John interrupted her, no Washington first, we go on a camping trip. Alexander, are you with us? 
Alexander nodded happily. He had enjoyed the ride in the automobile terribly. Now the boy dreamed that they would all go together to the end of the world, to the sea. John snorted and washed himself under the jets of water. Grandfather, give the polish, Alexander called. The guy stood all wet with a rag in his hands. In a moment I'll fly, the old man squawked and went into the barn. Meanwhile, behind the fence someone called the guy. Alexander looked outside the gate, Harry. Hi. What, you were racing through the fields again? A friend smiled broadly. Come on, let's go for a walk, come on. But I just need a little help with my grandfather's car. Harry jumped over the hedge. The friends quickly got on with the simple job. Don't do any tricks, John whispered to his grandson, so we don't have to pick you up from the children's police station again. Grandpa, everything will be fine, said Alexander cheerfully. He changed his clothes and headed to the center of the village, discussing with a friend the news of the day. Listen, your Angelica is going to go to the pedagogical university, Harry whispered worriedly. Alexander made a disgruntled grimace. Angelica Sokolnikova, Alexandra's girlfriend, was planning to enter the Moscow Food Technical School. Why the new plans? I'll go talk to Burr. What's the joke? The guy was genuinely surprised. Well, that's why I came to you, whispered Harry. She's with the girls on the climb. I decided to tell you the whole truth about your beloved. Shall we go together? I have to talk to her myself. Alexander stopped the curious boy. Understood, Harry grumbled. They said their goodbyes, and Alexander headed towards the climb. From there a deafening girlish laughter could already be heard. Angelica, look, yours is coming, Marime yelled. Angelica was sitting with her back to Alexander. She turned around and happily waved her hands. Alexander, and I was just going to you. I can already guess why, Alexander said grudgingly. The hot blood of his father played in him. Alexander, what are you doing? The girl raised her eyebrows in surprise. Let's go, let's talk, Alexander dragged her by the hand. Let go, it hurts me. Angelica shrieked. Alexander came to his senses a little. The girl's shout stopped her. The guy stood for a second, then turned around and went home. Stop, why did you come? Angelica shouted. Nonsense, Alexander muttered, without turning around. Well, go away, it sounded behind me. I was going to leave you anyway. You're too hot-tempered, we can't be together. Alexander went even faster. Angelica's words cut with a knife. What a fool I am. I trusted her and she was just mocking me. Well, so be it. Let her go wherever she wants. I wanted to howl with anger, to go back, to say something hurtful. But the guy knew too well his temper would get him into trouble. Several months passed. The young people from the village left for their studies. Alexander was also going on the road. He successfully entered where he wanted. The capital kindly opened to him the road to a great future. Angelica never came to see him off. Apparently, the girl was afraid to show her face. Washington kindly opened her arms to the boy. Ten years passed. Alexander rarely appeared in the settlement. Old people only occasionally received his letters. It was the dashing 90s. Everyone earned as much as they could. Money was critically lacking, but John sent the last penny to his grandson. He knew how hard it was in the capital. And what was his surprise when the grandfather received from his grandson a weighty package with a letter? There was money in the bag. My dear grandparents, I am writing to you with great love. I am doing well, I found a great job. I've moved into a rented apartment. I'm sending you money so that you don't need anything. By the way, Angelica from our village has moved in with me. We're together now. Grandpa, buy new spare parts. That should be enough money. I want your swallow to serve you for a long time. Grandpa, you should buy a new dress or a scarf. I'll help you every month with money. Don't worry, I'm fine, your beloved Alexander. Wife, shouted the grandfather. Come here. What's going on? The old woman fussed. She was baking pies in the kitchen and came running into John's room, covered with flour and dough. I'll wipe my hands. Did your grandson write a letter? He did. The old man threw a stack of bills on the bed. Oh my God, Leslie begged. So he must have joined some criminal group, you naughty boy. I've seen a lot of that on TV in big cities. Oh my God. The old woman clasped her hands in mute prayer. So grandmother, don't be so hot. Maybe you really found a job. Pack your things, let's go to visit him. I'm feeling a little uneasy. 
Leslie fussed and pulled out a large suitcase, and John went into the yard to tidy up the fort before the long journey. The old people were right Alexander at that moment roof peddlers at the market and beat out of them money for safety, and his Angelica got the rarest collections of clothes jeans, suits, foreign jackets. The guy got into the grouping not by accident one of his friends offered to earn good money. As they say, if you have entered back there is no way back. Alexander realized that the case is bad, smells of crime, but there was no turning back. Criminal authority nicknamed Shram kept all his subordinates at gunpoint. He knew where the guy's parents lived and in any case he could raid there and make a mess. Alexander tried to hide from Scar, but he found the guy and gave him the last chance to correct himself. When extra money began to appear, the guy decided to help his relatives. But so he once again slept in front of his grandfather and grandmother. John and Leslie never made it to Washington. They died on the highway when they collided with a truck. The grandfather gave his soul to God at once and the old lady died in the intensive care unit from blood loss. Alexander learned about this terrible accident only after a few days hospital workers could not find relatives for a long time. The guy buried his grandfather and grandmother in the village with all honors. A little wrinkled guy decided to restore Shram kindly offered the services of his service station. And you need to fix such a bunkin, he said in surprise, when Alexander brought the car on a tow truck, I'll bring you a foreign car from the Baltics. Do you want it? This is a memory of my grandfather. He was instead of my father, Alexander muttered, and tears came to his eyes. I'm sorry, brother, for touching the notes of your soul. I didn't mean to scar, though he was a bouncer in a gang, could sympathize sometimes. Listen, why don't we give your Ford a little makeover? New wheels and rims, repainted, tinted, and the interior could use a makeover. We'll put in a new stereo so it'll kick ass. Eh? Let's do it. It's a good idea, the guy agreed. Suddenly, his cell phone rang in his pocket. I'm listening, said Alexander. There was dead silence in the receiver. Then something clicked and a sob was heard. Sonny, I'm sorry to bother you. You have the wrong number, the guy mumbled and wanted to press off. No, please, pleaded the woman. I took your phone number from a nurse. When you were wounded in the hospital, I worked there as a nurse. I recognized you right away. I'm sorry I didn't come up to you and say hello. I was right next to you when you were discharged. I didn't dare. I couldn't. And now I'm dying. It's a boomerang, and I've had a bad life. Your grandparents are probably looking after you, aren't they? They're dead. Alexander hissed angrily, who are you? Why are you calling me? My mother abandoned me. She's not even interested in my fate. Alexander, my dear, I left you. Yes, you did. At the other end of the wire, a woman's hurried voice was heard. She was probably afraid that the guy would hang up early, and she would not have time to say the most important thing. I don't have much time left. My husband died, Evan, remember? He saved you and me. I was pregnant with his baby, but it was stillborn. And now it's the other way around. Our second child was born, but my husband is gone, dead of lung cancer. You have a brother. I'd really like you to meet him. I'm not interested in all this. I lost my mother many years ago. You probably want money from me, don't you? Charlatan. Alexander pressed the button. That's it. Silence. The woman never called again. What's the problem, brother? Scar's face was right behind Sasha's back. He was squinting curiously at the guy. No, it was a wrong number. Alexander shrugged. They were telling me some bullshit about a new rejuvenation procedure. Scar laughed loudly. You suggested to your fiancée, Angelica. I think she'll appreciate it. Angelica, you're the only thing I have now, the guy thought fondly. A month later, Alexander drove the updated Ford out of the garage. Scar invested a lot of money to fix the dents, broken glass, some parts. The car was repainted red, and black stripes were put on top of the hood. Ford now looked like a racing car. Alexander was pleased and happy like a child. The late grandfather's pride was on the move again. The old man heard a mooing. Inside the car stubbornly wanted to communicate with him. You know, I've seen so much in my life you have no idea, whispered Alexander, tightly pressed against the trunk. The sounds got louder. And if you had imagined it, you go gray. I disarmed more than one criminal group with this car. And how many times I've raced it with brothers. And I always came in first. You got the wrong guy. You think if I drive an old car, I'm gonna get hurt? Now lie there and think. I hope you're comfortable. Angelica pressed her lips together. 
talking about a new car irritated Alexander. How could Angelica talk about such things? She was not the one who sat and repaired the radiator for hours. She was not the one who repainted the scratched trunk for the third time. Women are one word. Irritated by the conversation with his wife, the old man went to the garage. The family lived in the suburbs of Washington. In a very prestigious village, Alexander was able to earn enough money for a rich old age. While her husband was hobbling around in the Ford, Angelica was packing a snack for a fishing trip and preparing a carrier for Rocky. The woman loved going out. She liked to spend time in nature or, in general, out of the house. Alexander was silent all the way, and only when he was sorting out the bags with fishing rods he calmed down a little. Rocky was already frolicking in the grass, and Angelica spread a colorful plate and laid out food, fruit, baked potatoes, sandwiches. Her husband had already chosen a spot and spread his fishing rods with bait. Angelica quietly approached him. Don't be angry, I snapped. It's all right. I am no longer angry, condescendingly replied Alexander. His gaze was focused on the fishing line in the river water. You know, I even like it, a rarity after all. It's been through so much with us. Yes, it has. It will survive us, Alexander said quietly. At that moment someone took the bait, the line twitched. Another moment and grandfather with a shout of joy pulled out a crucian carp. The fish was caught on the side of the hook and twitched ridiculously. It's a pity he can't let it back out. The wound is too deep. We'll have to fry it, he said sadly. Angelica's attention was distracted by a noise coming from a little above the clearing where they were camped. While her husband was fishing, the woman quietly walked up the path. The path was so steep that sometimes Angelica had to grab onto large weeds growing out of the ground. Finally, the woman made her way out into a nearby clearing. The place was very tempting. Angelica even regretted that she and Alexander had not climbed a little higher. The clearing was surrounded on all sides by old birch trees, and the middle was empty, without bushes and trees. Very cozy, but something else caught the woman's eye. In the distance, at the very edge of the clearing, a fire was burning. Well, it's an outrage. Who would think of burning a fire in the forest? It's not far to a fire. Angelica looked at the people who were at the fire but without her glasses it was extremely difficult to see their faces. A little to the left stood a few foreign cars of the latest models. I wonder how they got here. We'll have to take a closer look, Angelica thought. Just then, a cat darted under the woman's feet with a growl and hiss. It was Rocky. He, like lightning, rushed on all sails to the merry company. Rocky, stop. You stupid animal. You'll get caught in the fire. But the fat man didn't react. Angelica had no choice but to follow the cat to the fire. Up close it became clear that in the clearing gathered local majors sons of rich parents. Angelica knew almost all of them by sight, but one guy remained a mystery. He kept a little apart from the others. Seeing the disheveled Angelica, the company started throwing obscene jokes in her direction. They're drunk. A hunch flashed through the woman's mind. We need to be careful with them. Who the hell is this? yelled one of the majors in a slurred voice. Have you come to drink with us? Join us. All right, take it easy. I'll find Rocky and quickly escape from the clearing to Alexander. The main thing is to be polite to these young men. Good evening. Say, have you seen a cat around here? He ran towards the fire. Well, mother, what are you using? The biggest of the guys laughed. We don't see anyone here but an old woman. What cat? What's he doing in the woods? He ran away from me. Angelica tried to smile, but her eyes were drawn to a white spot in the grass, not far from the burning flames. Could it be a swan? The woman stared in silence for a moment, then decided to ask, Who is that sitting in the grass? Oh, that's our dinner tonight. We caught it in the park. He was screaming like crazy. Would you like some fried swan? They say it's a delicacy. A guy standing on the sidelines suddenly started talking. Mother, I wish you'd get out of here. I know you and your husband. Go in peace. Don't disturb me. We'll find a cat and bring it to you. You're fishing in the lower meadow by the lake, aren't you? Mark, what are you doing to her? The fat man grumbled. Let her stay with us. Let her get away. Her husband is probably sitting there looking at frogs. And the old woman is bored. Come here, chicken. We'll give you a treat. And you'll cut up a swan for us. The boy laughed and made an unmistakable gesture with his hand. Archie, Calm your talents, said calmly Mark, woman, go back where you came from. 
No, Mark, you keep your mitts down. What a leader you are. The knife will soon replace you. He'll get well and come back. The knife won't come back, Mark answered, twisting a long thread sticking out of his t-shirt on his finger. I won't let him. We've had enough adventures on our heads. Let him look for new slaves. Young people, intervened, finally, Angelica, maybe you let the poor bird go. It's suffering. And I'll bring you my cooking. Go away, woman. Your cooking is already cold. Eat it yourself, with your old man. Archie turned to the company. Guys, why don't we go and have a taste of that old bag's cooking first, and then come back and roast this lovely bird? No, Angelique pleaded. Please don't kill the animal. It hasn't done anything to you. Hear that, Mark stepped out of the shadows and crossed his arms over his chest, were you to be calling the shots here? Meanwhile, Rocky, trotting around looking for a missing field mouse, flew right at the company and slammed his whole body into Archie's leg. What the hell is that lump of bones? The fat mountain was genuinely surprised. The guy picked up the mewling animal and looked slyly at Angelica. She froze from fear and surprise. What will they do now, these spoiled rich people? Here, Mark, let us throw this furry one into the fire. What would happen to him? The fat man shrieked with lively interest. The others supported the fellow with whistles and shouts. No, shrieked Angelica and rushed to Archie. Mark, sensing a showdown, stood in front of Archie. His face expressed both determination and despair mixed with uncertainty. Alexander, meanwhile, was fishing. He had caught several large redfish and now glanced at the bucket occasionally, clucking his tongue in pleasure. The absence of his wife did not bother him. Angelica liked to walk alone in the woods. The old man's tranquility was interrupted by Angelica's desperate cry from the upper clearing. The old man, who had been in all sorts of fights, quickly rushed to the ford and pulled out a hunting rifle from the trunk. He checked if it was loaded. Alexander did not even remember how he climbed up the slope. He had already imagined a ferocious boar pouncing on his favorite woman, but what was his surprise when the picture of consciousness and the present did not match? There were seven men in the clearing, all young boys. They had surrounded someone and were discussing something heatedly. Well, dispersed to the sides, Alexander commanded and clicked the bolt of the gun. The crowd dispersed immediately. Grandpa, what are you doing? Drop the gun, Archie babbled. Alexander only now noticed that Angelica was lying face down in the grass, her dress slightly raised. Hey, you bastards, get on your rigs and get the hell out of here, roared Alexander, swinging his weapon threateningly. Old man, take your wife and get the hell out of here. We didn't touch anyone, but yours came here and started asserting her rights. Mark glinted his eyes in the darkness. He, unlike his friends, held himself with pride and courage. Who are you to tell me what to do? Maybe you also have a gun. Alexander's eyebrows flew up. The whole elite town knew about the old man's past, and no one had ever crossed him. And here are the youngsters. Arrogant, drunken majors. I don't have a gun yet, but Knight's gonna give me his armory soon. You know who he is, don't you? I know who the hell he is. He ain't giving you nothing. Boys. Archie, meanwhile, had let go of the hissing cat. He must have had a new prank in its head. Let's shake the old man's wheelbarrow and see if the hundred-year-old dust falls off. The other majors howled approvingly, some of them already headed for the path leading down. Angelica sat down on the grass and quickly lowered the hem of her dress. The screaming cat scrambled into her mistress's arms. The swan also made a sound. Its cry, like the sound of a trumpeter, cut through the silence of the forest. And she... Mark's face stretched out and became like the image of a demon, and really boys, his Ford is probably downstairs. Those Jews don't have any other cars. That's weird. You stole a lot of money and you can't buy something new. Halt. There was the sound of gunfire. Some of the guys crouched down, covering their heads with their hands. Archie was stunned. Mark just jerked and then froze again. What a shot. Are you crazy? One of the majors shrieked fearfully. So Alexander began quietly. His voice trembled, but the old man spoke confidently, thinking over every word. It goes like this. Now you release the poor bird, give it to us. Then you apologize to my wife. And last of all, you get on your cool cars and get out of here. Angelique was still sitting there sobbing. Alexandra, Alexander, I'm so scared. Come here, Angelica. Alexander gently drew the woman to him and kissed her. 
He was beautiful in this anger. Immediately remembered the slutty 90s as he, together with Scar, brought order to the spontaneous markets, collected taxes from sellers and shuttle traders, selling quality clothes from Turkey. And now some gang of teenagers led by a stupid boy want to show him, one of the leaders of the criminal gang, how to live. No, that's not gonna happen. Who's in charge here? He asked in a business-like manner. The silence lasted only a few seconds. Mark stepped forward and proudly stuck out his chest. Well me? What now? Do you have a car? Mark nodded in agreement. The guys froze in surprise. What's going to happen now? Let's make a bet. Whoever is the first with his car to arrive at the conditional place will yield. And I'll be in charge of our elite neighborhood again, just like before. And Knife will be my assistant. There was a surprise murder in the crowd. Mark grinned crookedly. Your car will die right away. Are you sure? The grandfather asked slyly. Then let's check it out. Get your car out on the highway. Mark went to his car. The others quickly took seats in other foreign cars. Everyone was interested to see the spectacle in which an old man, a former brother, would be trampled by car wheels. Alexander also turned and headed for his car. What are you up to, you old chump? Angelica ran behind and could not hold back her anger. How are you going to compete with these teenagers? They'll overtake you in the first few seconds. Quiet, wife. Let's go faster. Don't forget you're rocky. Don't worry. Alexander got into the car. Angelica and her cat squeezed into the back seat. The guys were already waiting for them on the highway. Someone took out a cell phone, ready to film the old man's shame. Show me what you have under the hood, Alexander asked, as if he were an experienced racer. You have never seen anything like this before. Look and memorize, said Mark proudly. He opened the lid, Alexander whistled. Well done, you've put a lot of amplification. Will the car withstand such acceleration? You can be sure. When I'm the winner, you'll be my personal slave, remember? Mark smiled wryly. Deal. But when I win, you'll give me all your power and your boys. They will become my assistants. Oh, yes. And the swan too. All right then. Let's see the inside of your car. I hope you haven't rusted through the lid yet. The crowd erupted in laughter. Archie threw obscene gestures and jokes in the direction of Alexander and Angelica. His wife stood nearby, hesitant to raise her eyes to look at the Ford. When the old man lifted the hood, the guys immediately fell silent. Eh? And how did it all fit here? Mark asked in surprise. You have to have a special mind. To make a racing car out of a Soviet car, the old man proudly stuck out his chest. Mark whistled. The guys were looking at the pumped-up motor with great interest. Well, let's go. Alexander asked cheerfully. Well, let's go. Mark's voice sounded less confident. Sit down, Angelica. I'll take you for a ride, said the old man to his wife. But don't be afraid. I'll strap you in and you won't even notice that you're flying at the speed of light. Come on, come on. Archie made a mark on the asphalt where the race would start. Listen, are you sure of yourself? Did you see what's under the old man's hood? He asked Mark. I did, I did but I'm not backing out, he said stubbornly. He checked the wheels and brakes and nodded to Alexander. That meant the guy was ready to race. Alexander, his wife whined in the back seat while Alexander was carefully fastening her seatbelt. You're crazy. We're going to die. It's not too late to refuse. My dear, the old man told her loudly, I won't be me if I refuse such a duel. Understand? It's a matter of principle. When the racers were in full gear, the crowd poured onto the road. Thankfully, the always busy track was empty today. It was all about making the race happen. All right, Archie shouted. His face was crimson with tension. Here we go. On the count of one, you start warming up your engines. And on the count of three, you move forward. The finish line is at the starting point. You get to the brickyard and at the first fort, you turn around. Whoever gets there first is the winner. To keep the race fair, I'll personally go to the factory and make sure you don't take any shortcuts. Mark, good luck to you. Go for it. And for you, old man, I wish your tires burst at the first kilometer. The crowd hooted and jeered. Angelica prayed and wailed loudly in the back seat. The cat was yelling at the top of its lungs. Alexander, the only calm passenger in the car, smoothly turned the key. The Ford rumbled. Someone kicked the hood with force. The majors were obviously not happy that the car had started. Three, Archie shouted. Come on, my dear, Alexander shouted joyfully. 
The two cars started at the same time, but the Ford slowed down noticeably before the first corner. The crowd of majors, seeing this, rejoiced and made noise. Alexander long ago, when he worked together with Scar, remodeled his baby, made it a racing car. Angelica was not interested in men's affairs, so the woman did not even guess what kind of speed monster the rusty trowel had turned into. Alexander liked to drive together with his mentor and often won in these races. He had gained a lot of experience in this tricky business, and now the old man slowed down for a reason. It's like running a marathon, he remembered Scar's words. You have to stop a little at first, so that you can make a big push before the finish line. Only then will you succeed. We will succeed, Alexander said loudly and pressed the gas pedal with force. The car, like lightning, raced toward the brickyard. Mark's car was far behind. Oh God, Angelique screamed. What's this doing, God? Do you like it, Angelica? He asked excitedly. I'll kill you at home. She yelled back. Just as soon as we get home. You better crash now. Len, you don't let me shake the old days. Alexander laughed and pressed the gas pedal again. Ford, with a rattle past the conditional marking of the finish line. The old man braked sharply. Rocky flew forward. Angelica gasped and froze. Mark's car didn't appear on the track until several minutes later. It was making a strange squealing noise. When the car pulled up, Alexander noticed that one of the wheels was oddly twisted. Mark rumbled grudgingly as he got out of his car. Well, what? Asked him joyful Alexander. Everything as we agreed, I won. So fulfill your promise. What did I say, Mark said, smiling slyly. Did you find a fool? If it weren't for the flat tire, I'd have come first. What difference does it make? Alexander asked the guy surprised. We had a deal. If I win, you give me all your company. And the swan in addition, for re-education. Did we sign a contract with you, old man? We didn't. Come on. Make sure we don't accidentally take your carriage off its wheels. Go home and calm down. Satisfied with himself, Mark turned and walked toward the crowd. He got into Archie's car, and the others hurried to their cars. The race was over, but all was not fair. The noisy bunch of majors hurried toward town. Mark's car remained parked on the road. I'll show you how to live by the rules. Alexander spat angrily. Angelica got out of the car and tried to console her husband, but it was all in vain. The grandfather, who had a great oriental character, started up like a new engine. Let's at least take the bird, Angelica said quietly. The swan must have stayed in the clearing. These young people do not write any rules. They do what they want. They do what they damn well please. All right, let's go and get your fishing rods and your bird. You'll think what to do with him. Swans don't live here. The husband and wife got back into the ford. The old man was in the worst mood. Angelica knew that such a state of mind would do him no good. Rocky sullenly climbed into her lap and purred. The animal definitely did not appreciate such a race. The swan sat obediently by the fire. The majors had tied its legs and wings with strong twine quite tightly. The bird looked at Angelica exhaustively, the animal did not even resist when the woman untied the ropes. Good God, he has wounds on his wings. He must have lashed out and hurt himself. Those bastards. Look, wife, what I found. Alexander picked up something shiny from the grass. It was an army badge with the initial Sir Brack of them engraved on it. I? Who could it be? We need to find out. They don't issue badges like that in the US, I don't understand. Guy must have served overseas. It's weird how a guy in the service got mixed up with a bunch of majors. We should get it back to whoever lost it, Angelica said firmly. Of course. That's what we'll do, said the grandfather slowly. And in his head he had a cunning plan to frighten the majors. Yes, so that for the rest of his life. While Angelica was gathering the cool provisions from the plate, Alexander was putting away the fishing rods with a stony face. There was no catch. They didn't often come home from fishing trips empty-handed, but today was a special occasion that knocked the old man out of his usual rut. He hadn't done his old business from the 90s for a long time, but he remembered how Shram had dealt with those brothers who betrayed him. Alexander was even afraid sometimes of his comrades' sub-sophisticated methods of torture that he came up with. After such an incident with the race, it's a matter of honor to avenge his offense. They decided to put the swan on the back seat. The bird sat obediently next to Angelica. 
The woman trembling hand stroked him and whispered something to the swan. Alexandra, let's leave him at home. Well, at least for now. The swan's wings are bleeding. He won't survive on his own. Please. All right, Alexander muttered. His thoughts were not at all about the wounded bird. Just take care of him yourself. Leave me out of it. Angelica sparkled with happiness. Rocky hissed unhappily at the bird, obviously not liking the neighborhood. I will track down this brave man who broke our treaty, and I will punish him. I won't kill him, of course, but I'll scare him so badly that he won't want to cross my path again. The main thing is that my wife won't find out and won't let me live. Alexander steadily turned the steering wheel of the car. Angelica fell asleep under the measured roar of the engine. The house appeared. There was bad weather outside. It was pouring heavy rain. You won't go out today. The man looked at the raindrops dripping down the dirty window frame. He put his hand under his head and thought. The recent incident on the highway with the strange old man in the Ford was on his mind. What a grandfather lives. He doesn't even look like an old man. He seems to be quite young. There's no way an old man could drive a car so skillfully. Well, or he was a race car driver back in the day. Interesting. Thought Mark. He was very hungry, but there was a mouse hanging in the refrigerator. The car the man had recently taken to the shop was badly dented and made a terrible screeching noise when he drove it. He didn't want to walk to the store for groceries. Mark got up on the bed and found his cell phone. Hello? Hey Archie, are you busy? Hi, came a sleepy voice from the receiver. I'm actually still asleep. What do you want? Do you want to come with me? Grab a bite to eat. No, I'm out. I had a little too much to drink last night. Too bad you weren't there. How's your Ariana? Did she show you around? Mark sighed. He met a pretty girl at a rich friend's party last night. Ariana had noticed the cute guy too. Their feelings flared up briefly and the man decided to invite the girl to his home. But when Ariana stepped over the threshold of Mark's modest dwelling, her welcoming face changed abruptly. What kind of shack is this? She asked irritably. Mark hugged the girl, but she pulled away. This is my apartment. What, you don't like it? That's strange. I thought you were as rich as your friends. Well, you got something strong. Mark was surprised. Ariana seemed like a very modest girl at the party. This behavior of the girl indicated that the young lady just wanted to make money from the young major through short meetings. You know, I don't keep alcohol at home. It's bad for your health, Mark muttered. The mood had clearly soured. Ariana noticed that. Okay, I should probably get going. It's boring here, she smiled. Go, Mark replied dryly. I knew I wouldn't meet a normal girl at a party where the only people there were profiteers. But Ariana was already gone. The door slammed and the apartment was quiet. Mark gave himself his word that he would find a girl who would love him not for money and wealth. Yes, she did. Mark answered Archie briefly. I knew you were a male. Is she with you? No, she left early this morning. I was still asleep. Archie laughed. You make sure you've got everything you need. Ariana likes to steal shiny things from other people's houses. Mark looked around with a sigh. What could be stolen? An old sofa or a chest of drawers? All right, Archie, rest up. I'll have breakfast myself. Mark replied, trying to sound cheerful and hummed up quickly. It's worth a little bit of backtracking. Mark was born into a complete family and grew up alone, without brothers and sisters. His father became very ill and passed away soon after. His mother followed his father a few years later. Mark was already an adult at that time and to his great happiness, he was not threatened with an orphanage. From his parents Mark received an apartment in Washington. At first the guy tried to study and work. But Mark soon abandoned his studies and had to work hard to survive in the capital. Suddenly Mark received a summons to the army. The guy did not want to mow from the service, and money to escape from the army was nowhere to take. The guy was taken for service in the paratroopers and in six months, he and his platoon were mobilized to California, a hot spot at the time, to help resolve the conflict. There Mark earned a wound and was soon returned home. The service ended, but a reminder of the terrible months of ruthless war served as an army badge with his initials Sir Bryakov Mark. After the army it was very difficult to find a normal job in the city. Mark went to the elite neighborhoods he hoped that the rich needed workers, and indeed, one family took the guy to them as a loader. Mark had to help the owner in the store to unload goods. The work was hard and dirty, irregular, but the owners paid well, so the guy was in no hurry to leave. 
That's where Mark met Archie, the pampered son of rich majors. Archie at first mocked the simple guy, but Mark was not timid either. He saw that the major collects weapons. The guy, fighting in a hot spot, learned to handle knives, guns, automatic rifles. So he gladly taught Archie to shoot. The guy spent hours at the range. Acquaintance grew into a strong friendship. Mark became a kind of family member. Archie introduced the guy to his company of young majors did not immediately accept him, but the stories of service in the army very interested them. In six months, Mark was already a kind of gang leader. He knew that it was necessary for the sons of the rich to frolic, to create something unusual, to shoot a cool video for his channel. Mark helped with that. After the guy had raced with the old man in the Ford and then refused to fulfill the terms of the contract, Archie and his company respected Mark even more. To them, feelings of responsibility, duty, honor were alien. Mark, of course, felt uncomfortable bullying the older man, but he had no right to act otherwise. The rich majors would stop accepting him, and he would become a beggar again. Poverty was what Mark feared most of all. The man got out of bed and stretched. No, this is impossible. Why did it start raining only when it was urgent to go out? Well, you could call a food delivery service, but you have to shell out a lot of money for delivery. In the pocket of the jacket should be a business card the other day a man went for new jeans in the hypermarket and one very pretty teenage girl slipped him a card with an advertisement for food delivery. Here it was. On one side was a picture of a pink flamingo standing on one leg and looking off into the distance. On the other side was an address and a contact number. Flamingo won't let you starve to death. The slogan read, well, let's see what they have on the menu, Mark said thoughtfully and went to the computer. But then his intentions were interrupted by the loud ringing of his cell phone. It was Archie. Did you change your mind? Mark asked cheerfully. No, he mumbled. I'm calling you because I got locked out of my house this morning by that grandfather who threatened us with a gun in the clearing. Mark fell silent. Strange, what does this weirdo want again? Maybe he wants to raise some more. And what did he want? Archie was silent for a few seconds then said abruptly. He found your badge in the clearing. He wants to get it back. No way, Mark replied thoughtfully. I always carried it in my breast pocket. How could it have fallen out? I don't know, replied the friend, but my grandfather refused to give it to me. He wants to meet you in person. Anyway, I gave him your phone number and you'll figure it out. Bye. There were short beats in the phone, which meant that the conversation was over. Mark put down his cell phone and went into the hallway. He searched the pockets of his jacket for a long time, but the token was nowhere to be found. So after all, he lost it, the man said to himself in confusion. How could he do that? To lose the most precious thing. Mark went back into the hallway and frantically checked his pockets. Phew, the photo of his mother was still there. The man grieved for a very long time after the death of the dearest person. The photo of his mother always reminded him that her soul was somewhere near, protecting his son from problems and danger. Mark carefully kissed the tattered photo and hid it in his breast pocket. The phone rang long in the hall. What a morning. I should have slept all day and turned off my cell phone. Strange, an unfamiliar number. Hello, Mark shouted irritably. There was dense silence in the receiver. I'm listening to you, repeated the man. Are you dead for what? Remember me? Suddenly a hoarse voice sounded sharply. We had a race with you. You also sent me away then. Ah, it's you, Grandpa? What do you want from my badge? I know you have it. I'll meet you at that forest clearing. Tomorrow night, we'll have a man-to-man -man talk there. Okay, Mark replied, let's do it at 8 o'clock sharp. The connection was cut off at the other end. Old boar, you want adventure at the end of your life, you're bored with life. Well, nothing, we'll see what he's up to. Mark smiled to himself. Such mystery and the place of weeding even turned the guy on, inflamed his imagination. Mark decided to do more mundane things and went to look at the delivery menu. Meanwhile, Alexander sat at home, in a soft armchair and had breakfast. Angelica had prepared an excellent omelet, which was impossible not to eat. The cat lazily jumped on the windowsill and looked at the gray wall of rain. Yes, I wanted to clean the yard today, put the flower beds in order, grumbled unhappily Angelica. Wife, don't grumble, Alexander said cheerfully, devouring the second portion of omelet. Go and read a book or embroider. Have a rest. The doorbell rang. Strange. Angelica was surprised. Who could come in such bad weather? Alexandria, yours. 
Mind, the old man rubbed his palms, go upstairs. It's not a woman's business to listen to men's secrets. Watch me, threatened Angelica with a finger. I'll find out that again you are robbing. Alexander got up from the chair and hugged his wife. Do not worry, my love. I've long been away from it. Just men bored at home came to me and backgammon to play. Angelica waved her hand, smiled and went up the steep steps to the second floor. Alexander jogged across the huge hallway and opened the door. On the doorstep stood his old friends, Steve and Mickey. Hi, why are you chasing us in this weather? Steve asked grudgingly. Mickey, meanwhile, deftly took off his soaked jacket and carried it into the bathroom to hang it on the dryer. That's a case, Alexander said quietly and put his finger to his lips, but not to anyone. This is our secret case for the three of us. Old man, have you decided to go back to the past? Well, I'll tell you that it's not the 90s anymore. Even the local police used to be afraid of us, but now they'll put their hands behind your back if you take a wrong turn. It's a matter of honor. Don't just stand on the doorstep, come in. Take off your boots, is your wife scrubbing the floors for you? Steve, meanwhile, had come back from the bathroom. He was standing by the fireplace, warming his hands with pleasure. It's not even fall yet, but it's so cold, he wondered. Well, come on, tell me about it. Mickey and Steve were practically the same age as Alexander. They met when they were all working for Scar. A strong friendship developed. Their wives were friends, too. I've already told you what happened to Angelica and me in that unfortunate clearing. Alexander began, as his friends settled into the warm, soft armchairs around the fireplace. Yes, it was. Mickey smiled wryly. The flames from the fireplace danced in his pupils. But what do you want now? Do you want revenge? Brother, you know the law of the boomerang. That brat hurt me badly and wanted to abuse my wife with his gang. Isn't that proof enough for you? If you don't want to help me, I won't force you. Go home. Steve will be enough for me. Well, don't get too excited. I just swore to my wife and children that I would no longer decide who lives and who dies. Steve nodded in agreement. He always listened for a long time and then spoke. No one is going to kill anyone. Alexander shouted and was immediately afraid of his own shout. Angelica could hear it. The old man listened for a minute, but the second floor was quiet. Apparently, his wife had dozed off. Then he continued in a whisper. I want to scare him. Remember what Scar did to us. Steve raised his bushy eyebrows in surprise. You want to stick this guy in a trunk and keep him there like an animal, then drive him into the thicket and let him out? Yes, answered Alexander innocently. I was badly offended, and Lena was also tried to rape. So an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I don't know, said Mickey quietly. I don't want to go to jail for kidnapping in my old age. So, you'll just help me catch him and put him in the trunk. I'll take care of the rest. Wait a minute, Steve, you don't want a guy to suffer in the trunk of your rusty truck. You can't even stay in there for an hour. Either you help me, or you walk away and forget about our friendship. We'd have always defended our honor and pride together. And now there are two fat bastards sitting in front of me, afraid to even move a leg. Alexander got up from his chair and went to the window. Well, if we can hide our faces so we can't be seen, Steve began, we can help. Yeah, yeah, Mickey mumbled. Alexander turned around excitedly. I knew you were real friends. We'll talk about it now. The main thing is not to tell your wives. We'll make up an excuse for our absence. The three old men gathered around the table again and began to discuss the plan of action in whispers. It was only after midnight when Angelica decided to please the guests with her special fish pie. The next day the rain did not hurry to leave the city. On the contrary, the downpour turned into a tedious and monotonous rain. The only thing that pleased the eye was the lush greenery, which had revived after a long heat wave. The foliage hummed with pleasure in the light breeze. Alexander sat in the kitchen and twirled a cup with cool tea in his hands. Yesterday with his friends they had thought over a plan of action to educate the young and insolent guy. Now it was only necessary to wait for the agreed time. Lately the swan, which Angelica called Baron, was able to walk around the house, proudly raising his head. Poor Rocky was locked up in one of the rooms, the bird, and the cat did not want to be friends. Delighted with the swan's recovery, Angelica ran after the bird and collected droppings all over the house. Now Baron proudly came out of the corner and approached Alexander in search of a treat. Well, you insolent creature, the old man crumpled, hold the cookie. 
The swan quickly swallowed a piece of cookie and nodded gratefully. Angelica came down from the second floor. She was in good spirits today, despite the rain. Alexander, you have thought of everything so well. It's been ages since I sat with my friends and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with them. I've been so busy. Are you going to Steve's tonight? Alexander smiled and nodded. Good. I'm off to pick out my outfit. The woman smiled and walked briskly back. Her loud, melodious singing sounded from the room. If you had known what kind of party you were going to go to, you would have eaten your brains out with a tablespoon long ago, Alexander muttered and gave the swan some more cookies. That's it go, you can't eat too much flour. My wife will scold me for spoiling her, he smiled. The baron shouted understandingly and went into the living room. Yes, you haven't shit there yet, the old man shouted after the bird, nothing, your mom will clean up after you. Time dragged on like hot caramel slowly and tediously. At half past eight, there was a noise of a car outside the gate, they're here. A few minutes later, the house was filled with a buzz. Women in bright dresses and expensive makeup swooped on Angelica like magpies. The wife was glowing with happiness, which couldn't be said for the men. The three friends were silent. Well, said Alexander, I leave you the most valuable thing, my wife. Have fun to the fullest. We'll go too. Angelica kissed her husband. She was already bustling around the table with bottles, plates, flowers from the flower bed. Steve, Mickey, and Alexander left the house together. I'd rather stay in the company of women tonight, Mickey muttered and looked up at the sky. It's gray and boring. You're like a woman yourself. Steve clapped his friend on the shoulder to Alexander, shall we go in your car? Yeah, I've got everything ready. Steve looked at the trunk and clucked his tongue. What's with the guns? Well, you never know. He's gonna attack. We'll have to be on the safe side. In the trunk, in addition to the gun, there was a water bottle, thick ropes, duct tape, and black hats with eye holes. I never thought I'd be doing this again in my old age. Mickey muttered as Alexander pulled out of the garage. It was cramped and stuffy in the car. Open a window. You could suffocate. It's okay. Now we'll drive with the wind. Alexander consoled his friend. Steve turned on the stereo. The car was filled with the sounds of an orchestra. It's more fun that way, he replied embarrassed. The road to the meadow was quite beautiful. On both sides of the road were thick birch and maple trees. It seemed that you were moving in some mystical tunnel. Gradually it was getting darker. There was not a single star in the sky. Rain fell in lonely drops on the car window. Alexander occasionally turned on the windshield wipers to remove the moisture and clean the glass. It's a good thing there won't be any clouds tonight, Mickey whispered quietly. Steve nudged his comrade in the side. Both fell silent. It should go well. I'll keep the kid locked up for a few days and let him out. At least he'll know not to mess with old people. Alexander tried to look cheerful, but he was not very good at it. Anxiety was growing in his heart. There was no telling what this major was up to. Maybe a knife blade would glitter in his hand, and the three friends would bid farewell to light forever. Or maybe he'll ambush them too. We don't know. The trail looed ahead. The four drove briskly into the wet mud. The car was not afraid of such a road. Alexander passed the swampy area without obstacles and turned out on a familiar place. No one. The old man looked at his watch. It was still quite early. He was in too much of a hurry, driving fast. We'll sit and wait. Steve said, putting on his hat. Mickey quickly followed him and also pulled on a black cloth with slits for eyes and mouth. You look funny, Alexander said cheerfully, looking in the rearview mirror. Oh, look, there's someone under the tree, Steve said, looking into the distance. Alexander looked ahead too. A little to the right of the forest road, there was a big maple tree. Someone was hiding under it. He's here. Go to him, Mickey muttered, and we'll join him later as agreed. Steve, get out of the car. We've got to put on a nice little circle to get in the back. Dan Rain, there's already water in my boots from the swamp. While Steve enjoyed cursing the weather, Alexander fumbled in his pocket for a metal token. A fine lure. Grandfather had been fishing for years and he was a pro at it. His friends marveled every time the man brought back a huge catfish or pike in a net. It will be the same kind of fishing. Only the bait is different and the fish are not fish at all flew a silly thought in his head. Alexander resolutely opened the door. Mark had been freezing under the branches for a good half hour. The tree saved him from the rain, but not from the cold. When the boy saw the Ford pulling up, he was genuinely glad. 
The car was still under repair, and Archie had agreed to give Mark a ride to the Cleary. But no more. The friend said he didn't have time to wait, turned around and drove away. Mark was left standing in the forest, at a complete loss. What a friend. What was there worth waiting for? A few minutes. I'll remember him. As soon as I fixed my car, Mark was angry and cold drops fell on his head. Well, hello Brad, Alexander said. He stood a little away from the boy and looked at him. The experienced eye of the former brother was searching for suspicious folds in his clothes. Had the major accidentally brought a weapon with him? Mark was silent. He only now realized that he was standing all alone in front of this strange old man in the forest. Various thoughts were swarming in its head. Where to run to if there was no car? Why hadn't he borrowed from Valerka one of the pistols from his huge collection? How come he had no friends with him? Why don't you say something? Didn't you learn to say hello to your elders? Alexander smiled. He took a token out of his pocket and waved it in front of the boy. Mark did not even see that two dark figures crossed the evening glade and disappeared behind the bushes. Hello, old man. What do you want for that token? You didn't just come here to give it away, did you? Alexander nodded. You don't know at all who you're messing with. Strange. Your major friends know, but you don't. Didn't they enlighten you? You're standing in front of a criminal mastermind who used to run this whole village and build people like you. So proud and arrogant, who don't know the meaning of manhood. I've never lived in this village, Mark shrugged, I work here for the owners. Sorry, I don't know who you are. So proudly sticking out its chest, Alexander continued, you humiliated me in front of your gang of rich and stupid freaks, and I want you to apologize to me in their presence. Mark's eyes widened. Are you out of your mind, old man? I'm not apologizing to you. Look for the fools. Suddenly the bushes nearby stirred, and two shadows hung over the guy. One low and broad the other long and skinny. Mark tried to scream, but his mouth was shut. Tie him up, someone shouted in a bass voice. The last thing the boy heard was Alexander's commanding voice. Put him in the trunk. Careful, don't hurt his head. Hurry up. The shadows were arguing. The voices were unrecognizable. Mark lost consciousness for a moment. The car was bouncing on the bumps. We had to hurry. It would soon be night. The wives must not guess where their wives were. Alexander pressed the gas pedal hard, and the old Ford sped towards Steve's house. The old man drove Mickey and Steve home, and they said goodbye, promising to keep quiet. Upon reaching his house, Alexander saw lights in the windows. There was music playing loudly. That's good. They won't hear it if he yells, the old man thought. He drove the car into the garage and turned off the engine, listened to the sounds, then walked forward and opened the trunk. Mark lay there with no sign of life. The old man carefully checked his pulse and exhaled with relief. Alive. His mouth was tightly taped shut. His hands and feet were bound with twine. Alexander locked the trunk and left the garage. Now it will be necessary to play an exemplary grandfather, so that no one noticed that he was hiding something. Nothing. But at least one major will be re-educated. Yes, so that the guy will disappear the desire to argue with the elders. Alexander went into the house. Angelica and her friends were sitting at the table. All were already tipsy. My husband has arrived. The woman shouted cheerfully. Come here, sit down with us. You know, my dear, I'll even drink today. Alexander replied. The burning liquid warmed the body and the head felt a little lighter. The old man helped his wife to call a cab for her friends. When the house was quiet, Angelica exhaled and plopped down on the small daven in the living room. You know, she said, it turns out Lucy and Steve are going to the Maldives for a month. They've already bought the tickets. Lucy was showing me pictures of what she's gonna wear to the beach. Despite her age, she's got a great figure. And I'm a mess. You are my most beautiful, hugged his wife Alexander, and you do not need any liposuction and injections of youth. Your Lucy cannot accept the fact that she is already 65. Alexander, promise me, blurred eyes Angelica looked at her husband. Promise that we will also fly to an island. I've never been abroad. All we did was drive around the USA. Lucy and Steve have traveled halfway around the world. I envy them. Of course we'll fly, Alexander said warmly, but we'll have to choose where to go. The main thing is not to be caught red-handed by the cops. Angelica quickly fell asleep in Alexander's arms. Her husband carefully covered her with a plate plate and went to the dining room to clean the table. 
He rinsed the plates and wiped the table. He put the set back in its place. He stood for a while, assessing the results of his labor. Then he left the house and headed for the garage. The car stood in total darkness, linting with headlights. The old man opened the trunk. Mark was lying with his eyes open. When he saw Alexander, he twitched and mumbled. Come on, be quiet. Calm down, you will not succeed. Stay a little in the trunk. Maybe it'll clear your head a little. God willing, it'll all come out. The old man rummaged in Mark's pockets and pulled out a cell phone. The device was password protected. All right, the old man grumbled. I don't need to go through your cell phone. Let it stay at my place. Alexander closed the trunk and went into the house. His wife was asleep. He looked at the clock. It was already past midnight. He lay down on the bed next to Angelica. She hugged him and smoothed peacefully again. Sleep stubbornly did not come. Alexander stared at the shadows that lined up on the wall in a bizarre pattern. And the wind made them move. The branches of the trees created their wonderful theater of shadows. How can I sleep, Lord? I've never felt such remorse before. And now I just feel like an executioner, he thought, putting one hand behind his head. Angelica woke up and stared sleepily at her husband. Alexander, why are you awake? I don't feel like it. Sleep doesn't come to me in any way, he mumbled in reply. Take a sleeping pill, advised his wife. Yeah, sleep, my dear sleep. I'll be right there. He got up, put on his robe. His wife was already dozing. Alexander quietly went out into the corridor. There was a sepulchral silence in the house. The baron slept on his perch by the fireplace in the living room. The old man tiptoed past the bird. To wake this one is not worth it. You will raise such a scream that not only Angelica, but part of the village will wake up. It was a bright night outside. Despite the cold rain, which had been pouring for several days in a row, it was quite warm. The large puddles had managed to dry up a little. Alexander walked up to the garage in his slippers. He kept thinking that Mark's screaming was about to come out of it. He couldn't stand it any longer and went into the small room again. Ford, the pride of more than one generation, stood, gleaming round headlights. Not a single sound. Alexander leaned over the trunk and whispered, be patient for a while, and I'll let you out. Don't scream and don't try to run, and don't try to tell anyone. You know, there are many quiet ravines. I stood again, listening to the perfect silence. He couldn't bear to lift the heavy lid. Betty Nye stared at him. The boy was crying. Why are you doing this? Alexander was sincerely surprised. You were so brave, and here you are crying like a girl. If you're already going to the end, then go. The guy mumbled and pointed at his jeans. They were wet. Wow, I didn't think of a restroom for a guy. Thought the old man frustratedly. Something had to be decided. Alexander spat angrily, closed the trunk with a clatter and got behind the wheel. He drove for a long time. It was starting to get light. Here I got into trouble, irritated old man said to himself. Such an idea to close the kid in the trunk for the fact that he just stumbled. Old asshole. The car turned off the road and drove onto a dirt path. Alexander kept his course toward the forest thicket. It was the first time he had seen these thickets. By the way, the old man had long ago left the borders of the region and drove into an unknown village. The forest was thick and overgrown. Alexander stopped at a small clearing. He stood for a few more minutes just like that. He listened to the barking of dogs, the noise of trees. Not a soul was around. Only the moon illuminated the grass, the leaves, and the car. Alexander sighed, walked to the trunk and opened it. The boy's face begged for mercy. I wanted to keep you much longer, of course, Alexander began, looking straight into Mark's eyes but took pity. I can't watch you ruin my trunk anymore. Anyway, you could be glad I'm letting you go. But my main condition is that you don't know me, you haven't seen me, and you haven't been in my trunk. Understand? Mark nodded. A tear ran down his dusty face like a rivulet. All right. If you so much as mention this to anyone, you're on your own. I'll kill you, but I'll find your ugly little soul. You see my friends? They'll help too, you can be sure of that. Now I'm gonna untie you quietly. Go away. By the way, we're a long way from our village, about 50 kilometers away. Look for ways to get home on your own. Alexander took out a knife and carefully cut the ropes first on his hands, then on his feet. Mark pulled the duct tape off his face with a groan. Hold your badge and cell phone, Alexander mumbled. The guy nodded silently and took the items. 
He carefully slipped the cell phone and token into the breast pocket of his jacket. Suddenly a crumpled photo flew out of there. You dropped it. Grandpa carefully picked up the black and white photo. On it was someone very familiar. Eyes, lips, affectionate smile, hands. Where did you get this picture? Wailed Alexander. His mother Selena was looking at him from the photo. I've always had it, the boy said quietly, why? Where did you get it from? Alexander's face stretched. As if from the distant past, his mother stood before the old man, crying in front of the airplane ramp. And below lay his sisters in a pool of blood. In the distance, his father fell to his knees with a confused face. Near him lay the ill-fated machine gun. This is a picture of my mother. She gave it to me when I was a teenager. I've kept it with me ever since. My mother is dead, but the memory of her is with me always. I don't believe it, Alexander said firmly, it's my mother, Selena. She and I ran away from California, then lived with my grandparents. Then she went to visit the volunteer who saved us then and disappeared. That volunteer is my father, Mark said quietly. There was a fog in his head, even. And I'm Mark. My mom used to tell me that she came to visit my dad when she was very young. She didn't tell me she still had kids. I guess she didn't want to, but she used to call someone and cry a lot. I was born when my mom was over 40. My parents were very fond of me, loved me equally well, but they both died too soon. I was already an adult, so I did not go to an orphanage, but stayed in my apartment. Good God, Alexander exclaimed. How did you end up here, in an elite neighborhood? I was looking for a job, that's all, simply answered Mark. I got a job as a loader for a rich major. Unloaded groceries, met Archie. So what? So you're my little brother? Mark smiled shyly. I guess I am. You're my maternal brother. I'm sorry, the old man's heart couldn't take it, I didn't know. You hurt me so much after the race that I wanted to teach you a little lesson. But I swear I'd never do that to my own brother. Tony, was your mom even happy with your dad even? I mean, my grandmother told me that my mom ran away from home with some scoundrel. And I believed it. Can you believe it? Honestly, I hadn't heard a word about you. Mark said thoughtfully. But if I had, I wouldn't have wasted a minute looking for you. I have no one but my parents. I'm alone in life. Alexander suddenly smiled. He sat down on a stump and covered his face with his hands. What an accident that brought us together. Mark stood next to him. He hadn't quite realized everything that was happening in his life yet. The guy just got over the fact that he was tied up and locked in the trunk. And here, it turns out that the one who tied him up is the most dear person. Alexander wiped away a stingy male tear. You know what, Mark? Get in the car. Where are you going? The boy asked. The fear was gradually receding. Let's go, Alexander corrected him to our house. I'll introduce you to my wife. If you want, you can live with us. There's plenty of room, enough for everyone. You'll be for your brother, and for the son of your children God didn't give you. By the way, remember that Swan your gang of majors were going to fry. He lives at our house. Let's go. Change your clothes, have a decent meal. Tell me about your life. The old man came up to Mark and hugged him affectionately. The Ford hummed pleasantly again. Mark sat down on the seat, Alexander, smiling, pressed the gas pedal. They drove toward the sunrise. The men only now noticed that it was morning. Alexander. Alexandra, Mark began softly. You can call me brother, the grandfather smiled. What did you want to ask? Tell me, how did you get it into your head to convert this car into a race car? Alexander clucked his tongue with pleasure. He liked talking about his Ford more than anything else. Well, it was a young thing. In the 90s we did whatever we wanted. I got the car from my grandfather. It became my favorite piece of machinery. I didn't even want to trade it in for something better. It was a betrayal to me. My partner helped me stuff the car with all the gas pedals and we started racing. If I'm gone someday, don't sell the Ford, you can have it. It's a good solid car. What are you doing? Mark smiled, we'll race with you again, brother. The car disappeared into the morning fog. Only its pleasant murmur could be heard. A new day was beginning. A new era full of unknowns and gifts of fate was beginning. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.